The intent of this video is to review the combat effectiveness of the World War II Disney Swish concrete penetrating rocket powered bomb. These bombs were deployed during four combat missions. The Disney rocket bombs were part of the Allies' advanced weapon systems designed to attack German reinforced concrete fortified targets like E and U boat pens, heavy gun emplacements, and flak towers. The roofs of these concrete fortified structures could be up to 23 feet thick. Let's start by defining the two types of bomb damage to thick concrete structures as defined on this page from an August 1944 declassified Office of the Chief of Ordnance document titled Terminal Ballistics Data, Volume 1. Perforation is defined as complete passage of a hole through a concrete slab, as shaded in this view. Penetration is defined as a part through crater with or without scabbing, as shown in these shaded views. Standard general purpose bombs like the one in this shaded image were not effective in bombing thick concrete slabs. If dropped from high altitude, their casings would rupture, and a subsequent loader detonation occurs with very little crater damage. Semi-armor piercing and armor piercing bombs could be adopted in bombing these structures, but the damage sustained is small due to the low explosive fill, and it would take a lot of bombs to strike the target from high altitude. This chart from a declassified October 1946 Army Air Force Proving Ground report titled Comparative Tests of the Effectiveness of Large Bombs Against Reinforced Concrete Structures Anglo-American Bomb Test Project Ruby shows the relative size differences of the specialized bombs developed to destroy thick concrete structures. The Disney Swish Bomb is shaded here. The Tallboy Grand Slam and post-war Amazon bombs are shown for size reference. The maximum reinforced concrete penetration of various bombs is shown on this image from a May 1946 Army Air Force's Scientific Advisory Board document titled Explosives and Terminal Ballistics. The upper x-axis is the weight class and type of bomb. The y-axis is the depth of either concrete penetration or perforation in feet. The drop bars in the body of the chart are for bomb release altitudes of either 10 or 30,000 feet. If dropped from a 30,000 foot altitude, a semi-armor piercing bomb will perforate around 6 feet of concrete, an armor piercing bomb 8 feet, a tall boy 16 feet, and a grand slam 22 feet. This image shows the Disney Swish bomb. The official name of the bomb is the Disney Swish 4,500 pound CPRA bomb. The inspiration for the bomb originated from a World War II Disney cartoon victory through air power. The bomb is in the 4,500 pound weight class. CP is concrete piercing. RA is rocket assist. This cutaway image shows the various components of the D Disney Swish bomb. The bomb is 17 feet long and its nose is 15 inches in diameter. The bomb steel casing weighs 2,900 pounds, the shellite explosive fill weighs 500 pounds, and the rocket assist unit weighs 900 pounds. The bomb's full up weight equates to 4,300 pounds. The bomb's forward body casing is a thick forged and hard steel cylinder with a concrete penetrating sharp nose shape. The 500 pounds of shellite explosive fill is contained within this cavity. Shellite has about 90% the explosive power of TNT. The two suspension lugs are located here. The two detonation fuses are located here. The Disney Swish adopted the British number 58 tail pistol fuses. Characteristics and a cross-section of the British number 58 fuse is shown here on this image from a July 1952 Department of the Army manual titled British Explosive Ordnance. The fuse's detonation train is either instantaneous or delayed target contact. The detonation train is delayed by detonators up to 11 seconds. The Disney Swish's fuses were typically set to a half a second time delay after impact. The fuse are armed at bomb release. No veins to rotate like U.S. fuses. Once the bomb contacts a target, the striker's inertia overcomes these thin brass cross tabs. The tabs bend up and the striker moves down the body, contacting the detonator, which starts the half-second detonation train. The fuse's detonation train will be on this small time delay after target strike to allow the bomb to penetrate deep into the concrete structure prior to detonation. The 19 bundled rocket motors are located in this section. 
The 3 inch rocket motors contain 12.5 pounds of a cursiform shaped flashless cordite rocket propellant. The cursiform propellant charge shape is shown in this view for reference. The burn time of the rockets is 3 seconds. An air load driven generator provides the electrical power needed for the rocket's firing system. The rockets are fired by an M111A2 countdown time fuse. This chart lists characteristics and a cutaway of the M111A2 fuse from a September 1945 U.S. Navy bomb disposal document titled United States Bombs and Fuses. The fuse time can be set for a countdown duration between 5 and 92 seconds starting after bomb release. The Disney's bomb fuse was set to start firing the 19 rocket motors 34 seconds after bomb release. This will allow a free fall distance of 15,000 feet at rocket firing. The bomb release altitude was set to 20,000 feet. The rocket motors would fire at an altitude of 5,000 feet for a duration of 3 seconds. The rocket-powered Disney bomb will penetrate 13 feet 10 inches of concrete on average, as discussed on this summary page from the reference shown earlier. Analysis implies a penetration of 16 feet 6 inches can be expected. The rocket motors increase the bomb's striking velocity by 26% and the penetration thickness by 31%. The six stabilizing fins are mounted in this tail assembly. The tail cone will be jettisoned once the rocket motors fire. This will expose the 19 rocket motor nozzles. The B-17s were the bombers designated to carry the Disney bombs. The Disneys were too long for the B-17s bomb bay. This view shows the location of the 17-foot Disney Swish relative to the B-17s wing external bomb station. Two Disney Swish bombs are loaded under each wing. The B-17s external racks are located between the inner engines and the fuselage at the wing root areas, like in this view. Prior to deployment in combat, tests were conducted to assess the performance of the bombs as discussed on this page from a June 1945 Army Air Forces Evaluation Board document titled The Relative Effectiveness of Various Types of Bombs and Fuses. 38 bombs were dropped on the German fortified bunker in Watton, France. The Watton bunker is a concrete reinforced captured German V-2 rocket site. This overhead view shows the location of the Watton site in the lower left-hand corner. The site is rectangular at 220 feet by 130 feet. Only two of the 38 Disneys struck the roof. The first struck without rocket assist. It penetrated 9.5 feet into the 17-foot thick roof without structural damage. The second, functioning Disney, penetrated 15 feet 8 inches. 5,000 cubic feet of concrete was displaced. There was scabbing on the inside face. 4. Key test takeaways included. The bombs were structurally intact. The rockets increased the penetration distances. A bomb miss is not damaging, like a tall boy or grand slam miss. Concrete displacement of the Disney's matches the displacement of a tall boy. These images from an Army Air Forces Board document titled Large Bomb Commission European Theater of Operations shows the Watton damage from the two Disney Swish bomb strikes. Let's take a look at a Disney Swish test release. This footage took place after the war under Project Ruby 2. An explosive inert Disney Swish is released from 20,000 feet. The rocket motors kick in at a 5,000 foot altitude. The bomb will contact and penetrate the target. The rocket motors are kicking in at this point. This clip shows the roof face at Disney contact. There was no explosive fill. The damage is from bomb contact only. There were four operational Disney missions in World War II. A total of 158 Disney Swish bombs were dropped, as shown on this table from a December 1945 U.S. Army Statistical Digest World War II. The first operational mission occurred on February 10, 1945. Nine B-17s from the 92nd Bomb Group were sent to attack an e-boat pen in Norway. The roof of the pens were 10 to 14 feet thick. There was at least one bomb strike. Unfortunately, no e-boats were in the building during the attack. 
Nine B-17s were sent again to attack the same target on March 14, 1945. This page summarizes the two attacks. One third of the 36 rockets failed to ignite. No reason was given for the high rocket failure rate. The bombs are aerodynamically stable and accurate. At least one bomb struck and concrete sections were removed from the north side of the building. The roof is 12 feet thick. More damage was observed on the south side of the target. Let's watch footage from this mission. 8th Air Force films of a B-17 loading a new type rocket booster bomb. Jacked into position, the 18-foot bombs fit on special wing racks. General Doolittle's men call the bomb the Disney Swish. Sub and E-boat pens and similar objectives where penetration of concrete emplacements is necessary. leaving a trail of smoke as it drives the bomb down at increasing speed, plunging it 40 to 50 feet into the ground before explosion. On the third mission, 36 B-17s were sent to the Valentin Submarine Assembly Factory in Farge, Germany on March 30, 1945. The roof thickness varied from 14 to 23 feet. At least one Disney of the 72 deployed hit the target. This image shows a Type 21 U-boat assembly line at Farge. On the fourth and last mission, 24 B-17s were dispatched to Hamburg, Germany on April 4, 1945 to strike at U-boat pens and other various hardened targets. Clouds obscured the area and the targets were sighted by radar. The results were unknown. After the war, additional tests were conducted on the Valentin Submarine Assembly Factory. These tests were known as Project Ruby. In one of the trials, 22 rocket-powered Disneys were dropped from 20,000 feet altitude. The explosive fill was replaced with an inert fill so the bomb's penetrating power can be measured. There were 11 hits and 11 misses. Eight rockets failed to ignite out of the 22 dropped. The rocket firing success rate was only 63.6%. The strike speed of the functioning Disney's equated to 1,450 feet per second. This equates to a speed of Mach 1.3. The results of the Ruby tests are outlined on this page. None of the bombs tested, Disney Swish, Tallboys, Grand Slams, or Amazons, were suitable in the destruction of the concrete fortified structures tested. The 22,000 pound semi-armor piercing Amazon and the Disney Swish bombs produced the greatest penetration, but the case strength needs to be increased to take the impact after perforation of the outer roof. The rocket-assisted Disney bombs did not function reliably. Additionally, the 500 pounds of explosive fill is not damaging enough for reinforced concrete structures requiring 20 feet or more of penetration. Unlike Tallboys and Grand Slams, a Disney near miss will have no damaging effects on the structure. The Disney bomb will penetrate 200 feet of soil and produce a 36 inch wide crater. Only direct hits count. Lastly, General Doolittle agreed with the results of this evaluation. The Disney bombs will strike at 1,450 feet per second and can be expected to perforate a concrete slab of 16 feet 4 inches if the rockets function and it's filled with 500 pounds of a shellite explosive compound. In summary, the Disney Swish bombs, although showed excellent concrete penetration power, they lacked sufficient explosive fill, lacked case strength for secondary strikes, and had high rocket failure rates. If you've enjoyed this weapon system review, please consider engaging with the video by liking, commenting, and or subscribing to the channel World War II U.S. Bombers.